Well, good morning and welcome again to Word for the Week, our online book study series here at Cornerstone Faith Community Church in Bloomingdale, Illinois. My name is Pastor Jeremy, and I'm excited to be with you as we look uh, this week at chapter 11 of the book by Jerry Bridges, The Discipline, the, the Discipline of Grace. Um, in this particular chapter, um, Bridges has us uh, turn first to Romans chapter 6. In verse 19, Romans chapter 6 and verse 19 says this, Just as you used to offer the parts of your body in slavery to impurity and to ever-increasing wickedness, so now offer them in slavery to righteousness leading to holiness. And the point of um, Paul's words there and Bridges' uh, message in this chapter is this, we have to make a choice. Each and every one of us has got to make a choice. We're either going to choose to live uh, seeking after, trying to obtain the things of this world, or we're going to live uh, striving after the things of God. We can't strive after the things of God and the things of this world simultaneously. It just doesn't work that way. So we would like to believe as humans um, with our sort of limited human minds that we have the com- we have the ability to seek both things. We can both be um, following after God and seeking after him and still kind of have a foot in the world and experience the world's things and do the world's things and, and sort of strive after them as well. But scripture tells us very clearly we can't do that. Um, Jesus put it this way. He said, you cannot serve both God and money at the same time. You can't serve both God and man at the same time. You can only serve one of those things. Because what happens is either you're going to love the one and hate the other, or you're going to so devote yourself to one that you have no time left for the other. And so you have to make a choice. And this particular chapter is all about choosing. And of course, about choosing God and his will for us. Um, Bridges begins this chapter on page 181 of the book. And he says this, um, I had grown up in a church setting. I had trusted Christ as my Savior, had read the Bible every day, and even memorized a few Bible verses. But the idea of of applying Scripture to specific situations in my daily life had never occurred to me. So that night I prayed a simple prayer, God, starting tonight I want you to use the Bible to guide my conduct. And my whole approach to the word of God changed overnight and the scripture suddenly became relevant to my daily life. That was the beginning of my own personal pursuit of holiness. I have to say that I love his usage of um, the idea of applying scripture to specific situations in my daily life. Um, I try so hard um, to help uh help you all understand the desperate need we have for application of God's word to our lives. Um, Some simple ways that we do that um, on Sunday mornings, I always try to close our time together in the word with some application, um, some things that you could do differently as a result of having heard this word from God. I often encourage you to think, how am I different? How could I be different? How should I be different? by having heard this word of God this morning. Um, We stand for the reading of God's word before we sit under God's word in our worship services. We do this to rightly apply all authority to God's word in our lives and in our hearts and in our minds. And so that's the application component. And I'm so on board with Bridges as he talks about this idea of us needing to apply scripture to our lives. Um, On page 183, um, Bridges outlines a list of practical instructions, he says, that the Apostle Paul gives to us where we have to make some choices. Um, He talks about this coming from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 25 through 32, where Paul kind of has this list of of choices we have to make in life. And he says we either have to, to, are we going to tell the truth or are we going to lie? 
Are we going to uh, deal with anger? Are we going to let it sit and smolder in our lives? Are we going to be um, absolutely honest when it comes to things like financial honesty and integrity? Are we going to speak only what is helpful to others? Or are we going to speak things that bring others down and break others down, criticism, gossip? Um, are we going to be compassionate, kind, forgiving? Or are we going to have bitterness and anger and resentment in our hearts? Um, Bridges says, in other words, the practice of putting off sinful attitudes and actions and putting on a Christ-like character involves a constant series of choices. The bottom of that page, um, Bridges brings to mind that passage we just talked about, Romans 6 and 19, um, and he says this, the believers at Rome had formerly offered parts of their bodies to impurity and ever-increasing wickedness. The more they sinned, the more they were inclined to sin. They were continually deepening in their habit patterns of sin simply through their practice of making sinful decisions. I would say it this way, maybe. Sin breeds sin. Um, perhaps you remember uh, your parents or your grandparents or someone talking to you about the, the, the sin of lying and how, you know, it starts out as one tiny little white lie and then it just kind of grows and grows and grows and grows and grows until it gets to the point where it's this really tragic, huge lie that has had a great impact uh, certainly on your life and on someone else's life, um, I would say always for the not for the good, always for the bad in their lives. So sin tends to breed sin. When we get used to sinning, it breeds more sin. So when we when we first think about that sin, we think, well, this isn't so bad. I'm sure God will forgive me. And so we kind of move forward with that. And then the next thing comes, up, well, that's not so bad. And then we move forward with that. And well, my God will forgive me. And it just kind of grows and grows and grows. And sin breeds sin. We become accustomed to sin. And then we lack... Um, we lack a, a, a offense towards it, and so it becomes okay with us, and it grows and it grows and grows. Why is that? Well, at the bottom of page 183, Bridges writes it so clearly for us. He says, what was true of the Romans can be true of us today. Sin tends to cloud our reason, dull our consciences, stimulate our sinful desires, and weaken our wills. Those are some critical things in our lives, to have a dulled sense uh, towards, towards sinful desires, to be weak in our will, to be, have, our, have our senses weakened amongst us. Um, these are all bad things, but that's what sin does for us. Basically, it does this. When we become prone to sin, when we um, allow sin to fester and live in our lives, it becomes okay. And we begin to approve of it. And we figure, yeah, God will forgive us. It's okay. Um, the opposite of that sort of lifestyle, obviously, is this discipline of making better choices. Choosing to live after God's will. Choosing to seek God's will. Choosing to serve Him, love Him, honor Him. And so, um, as we get towards the middle of page 184, Bridges says, So it is through righteous actions that we develop holy character. Holiness of character, then, is developed one choice at a time as we choose to act righteously in each and every situation and circumstance that we encounter during the day. He's so right on about this. Um, making choices is maybe, well, obviously, the hardest thing we'll do in every day. To make the choice to serve God, to love God, to know God, to honor God, instead of to follow after the things of this world and and go as the world goes. Um, I remember a very um, powerful conversation I had with Sarah's grandmother. Um, I don't I don't believe Sarah and I were married yet. I think we were engaged to be married, but her grandmother and I had just had this great conversation, and she said, "Jeremy, here's the thing. Every moment of our life." is about choices and at some point in our lives we're going to look back on all those different moments and we're going to say in in this set of moments i made some really great choices and in this set of moments i made some really terrible choices 
And what we tend to do is we tend to focus on, I made bad choices in those moments. We start to drag ourselves down and we start to beat ourselves up. And, and um, if we can begin to have more moments in our life where we go, I, I made some good choices there. I, I, chose, I chose God in that moment. That can really build our spirits up uh, pretty quickly. So Bridges says, we become more holy by obedience to the word of God, by choosing his will as revealed in the scriptures in all of the, ver uh, all of the various circumstances in our lives. I really love on uh, page 185, I think this is uh, an amazing illustration. I, I hope that you've already read it, but I want to read it together again quickly. Um, page 185, starting at the top, it says this. While I've been writing this book, my wife has begun to make a quilt. I have observed her work. I have learned that she first makes a number of quilt squares, each one foot square. It is the design she sews into each of those squares that determines the overall pattern of the quilt. The particular design she has chosen, a mariner's compass, is rather intricate with each square containing about 40 rather narrow triangles. Each quilt square is beautiful and is a testimony to her sewing ability, but those individual squares, as beautiful as they are, do not make a quilt. It is only when they are sewn together with a narrow strip of cloth between each row of squares that they become a quilt. The pursuit of holiness may be likened to a quilt. We have the quilt square of discipline, the square of dependence, of commitment, convictions, and beholding the glory of Christ in the gospel. Each of these squares is beautiful in and of itself. But if we just look at these principles and means of holiness individually, we still do not have the quilt of holiness. What joins all these principles and means together to form the quilt of holiness is obedience. And we obey one choice at a time. Um, we are building these quilts of our lives by the choices we make. And yes, we make bad choices sometimes. We choose the wrong thing. Um, that becomes a part of our quilt for a moment. But the beauty of God's forgiveness for us, right, is that he allows us to sort of have a, a seam ripper. And when we will confess that we have put something into our quilt that is not good, it's not right before him, he'll give us the seam ripper and we can rip those seams out and we can remove that quilt. We can replace it with a good square for the quilt. I think making choices causes us to use our spiritual muscles. Um, Bridges talks about how um, uh, Paul likens so much of the discipline of holiness to athletics, training for some kind of athletic challenge, some kind of athletic competition, getting your, 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 your muscles in order. And I think making choices is how we exercise those spiritual muscles. Um, and what happens, interestingly enough, when we exercise our muscles is we learn something called muscle memory. Now, there's a lot of different ways that muscle memory plays into our lives. Um, in, in, the, in the lives of professional athletes, for example, like a football uh, quarterback, um, just the, even the way he, his hand holds the ball on a particular kind of pass, um, the way that his arm moves forward and throws that ball on a particular kind of pass, he learns over time a muscle memory and he can, he can do that in his sleep. He knows exactly how that's supposed to feel and he can tell whether he's, he's made a good pass or a bad pass by whether or not that muscle memory has felt right. As a musician, we talk about muscle memory so often, um, whether we're playing an instrument like a trumpet or even a stringed instrument or a piano. Muscle memory comes into play in piano uh, so often. Um, your fingers, when you're playing piano, you begin to, you know, I, I can play uh, one, three, five, you know, a standard chord with this set of, 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 of of my fingers and my my fingers know this muscle memory and but they also know that if i'm going to shift from from say a major chord to a minor chord I, I very often then change the how the how the how my hand moves and it's a muscle memory thing so if i'm reading a piece of uh of music and it and it's got a major chord and it tells me the next measure is a, a minor chord my, my fingers just kind of naturally know to go psh, like that and um we learn this muscle memory as we practice 
Same thing with our spiritual lives. We have got to get used to training our muscles for God, choosing him, making choices that serve him. And so we want to develop muscle memory when it comes to God. Um, the rest of the, the chapter, um, Bridges goes into this talk about mortification. Um, and he talks about how um, we ought to be mortified by our sin. And I, I'm not going to talk too much about that. I, if you haven't read it, please do. It's a great um, discussion of sort of how we ought to treat sin in our lives. Um, but on page 191 is where I want to sort of wrap up with this video for today. How to put sin to death. <clears throat> At the bottom of page 191, what does it mean to mortify or put to death the misdeeds? That is, the sinful expressions of this body. First of all, Paul did not say to mortify indwelling sin, but rather sins, which are various expressions of indwelling sin. We cannot eliminate indwelling sin in this life. It will be with us until the day we die. To mortify a sin means to subdue it, to deprive it, of its power to break the habit pattern that we have developed of continually giving in to this temptation of that particular sin. Um, it fits so well with what we just talked about this past Sunday in, in worship here at Cornerstone Faith Community Church as we talked about God's promise um, as it relates to our disgrace of sin. Um, and and I, I, I commended to you, exhorted you in that moment, and I will do so again this morning. The, the key component with our sin is that we must confess it. And part of the muscle memory we need is the muscle memory of saying, I'm sorry, I've sinned against you. I made a bad choice. And, and so I'll remind you that, you know, when it comes to our sin, God has promised us forgiveness. He's promised us to be rich in mercy and rich in love and to forgive us. But it requires us to come before him and confess. You've got to tell him about your sin. You've got to be willing to come clean. And that's got to be a part of your muscle memory, too. This life is all about choices. And um, we would each do so well to begin building our own discipline of making good choices as it relates to God. I hope that you will have uh, a great week this week. And I hope this video is a blessing to you. I will meet you together here again next week as we um, step into chapter 12 and we talk about the discipline of watching, watching and praying. Um, that'll be a great discussion as well. Uh, look forward to seeing you then. Have a great week.